Well, the moment we've been waiting for for the whole book of Job finally comes in Job chapter 38. Yahweh shows up and answers Job. Uh, so he's been quiet up to this point, but now, remember Job's last speech, he's basically sworn out a legal document charging that God needs to make a defense of himself. So God finally does show up to make a defense of himself. And in chapter 38, well, when God answers, that's one of those times when I think you need to be careful what you ask for. Uh, then Yahweh answered Job out of the whirlwind or out of the storm. Uh, it's the same word that would be thought of as tornado. So we're talking about a violent storm that's being answered here. Uh, verse 2, God starts with, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you declare to me. This is probably not going to go well for Job when God opens with, Where is the stupid person at? And if you time for you to put your big boy pants on, and I'm going to ask you some questions. So not really going to be a, a really good thing for Job, I don't think. We know it's going to go badly for him. Uh, but now let's look at God's questions. Uh, verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understandings. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Have you entered the springs of the sea? Or... Walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare, if you know all this, where is the way to the dwelling of light? Or where is the place of the darkness, that you may take it to its territory, and that you may discern the paths to its home? Surely you know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. God is getting a little snarky here with Job on this one. The questions of God all throughout this uh, first speech, emphasizing over and over again how big God is, and how small Job is, and how powerful God is, and, and how lack of power Job is, and, and how God is everything, and Job is ultimately nothing, and just driving it home. One, do you know where the mountain goats give birth? Do you know, you know all these questions that, that no human can answer? That's what God is hitting him with over and over and over again. Um, and I do need to add one sort of aside, a very interesting kind of aside that you might want to be aware of. Um, in chapter 39, uh, God is in the midst of answering these questions, asking these questions of Job over and over again. Um, and he has, well, look at the text first. Is the wild ox willing to serve you? Will it spend the night at your manger? Can you tie it in the furrow with ropes or will it harrow the valleys after you? Now, any time, the, the point of this would seem to be that can you tame the wild ox? And the answer is, well, no, it's, it's a wild ox. You can't tame a, a wild ox. You can tame another, a domestic ox, but you can't tame a, a wild, it's a wild ox. That's why we call it that. Um, but what's really interesting about this is you have the word manger. And, and any time you see that word manger, particularly Christians, when you read that text, that, that word instantly calls up uh, de December, right? It instantly calls up Christmas. It instantly calls up Jesus. And, and so that's, that's not surprising that, that uh, there are some interpretations that see this as a sort of God's dropping the mic moment. Uh, yeah, well, well, well I, wild ox be at your manger, huh? Well, be at mine. Um, that that's kind of the point. I think the point is, can you tame the wild ox? Job, no, you can't. Of course I can because I'm awesome. Um, but when you have that word manger, there are people who sort of have read this as some sort of prophetic statement of, of God um, having a wild ox at his manger. Uh, but what makes this even, I don't know, even funnier is that in 1611, when the King James Bible was translated, uh, the Hebrew word for wild ox was not known to the King James translators, and they re weren't really sure what to do with it. Uh, and so in the King James, um, it, it's, it's not wild ox, it actually is the word unicorn. And so in Job 39.9, God asks, will a unicorn spend the night at your manger? Uh, and so for that reason, uh, if you want to put together a full Bible nativity, you could put a unicorn in the, in the manger there, and I guess as long as you're using the King James, uh, be biblical. I think there are three other two other places in the Old Testament in the King James translation where the word unicorn occurs. It's this word wild ox. Most modern Bible translations say it's just wild ox is probably the translation we're going for there. But uh, but it's true that the King James Bible does have the word unicorn uh, in there. So uh, I guess that's, you know, fun to mess with your friends with, I guess, on that. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, God is rolling on this first speech, hammering Job question after question after question. And in uh, chapter 40, God opens with a rhetorical question that apparently Job thought was a question he was supposed to answer. Uh, because Yahweh says to Job, uh, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? Anyone who argues with God must respond. So apparently Job thought, oh, God wants me to respond. Um, and, but my advice is, if God is rolling, 
you let God roll. You don't try to interrupt God. It's going to go bad for you there. Um, because Job answers Yahweh, I'm unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. But God was rolling. Uh, so God comes back in in his second speech. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind or the storm or the tornado. Gird up your loins like a man. Put your big boy pants on. I will question you and you declare to me, will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? Deck yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and all look on all who are proud and abase them. Look on all who are proud and bring them low. Tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then... I will also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can give you victory. Tell you what, when you're God, we can have this conversation. When you can deck yourself with glory and splendor and bring down the wicked and, and do all the things that... When you're God, we'll talk about this. I'll defend myself to you. But right now, no. No, you, you, you're not there. Sorry. Uh, he goes on in chapter 41 to address that thing that Job brought up way back in chapter 3. Remember in chapter 3, uh, Job is wanting to rouse up Leviathan, that evil watery chaos dragon, that, that, that personification of primordial chaos, the enemy of God and the enemy of creation. Well, God directly addresses Job's desire to be on team chaos. Uh, he says in chapter 41, can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down its tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope through its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Will it make supplications to you? Will it speak soft words to you? Will it make a covenant with you to be taken as your servant forever? Will you play with it as a bird or put it on a leash for your girls? So basically, God's point is, yeah, Leviathan doesn't scare me. Uh, John Levinson wrote in his commentary on Job that uh, in the book of Job, Leviathan is a rubber ducky for the divine. God's like, yeah, yeah, don't scare me with Levi Ooh, Leviathan, big scary. No, I, can, I tame Leviathan. I put a, a rope through his nose. I lead it around. I, I can put it on a leash. You can't even touch it, and, and it's nothing for me. Uh, so yeah, team chaos doesn't really scare me. You don't have anybody on your side that's as big and powerful as I am. I'm amazing. You are not. Just wanted to make sure you understood that. Well, God, after I'm huge and smart and powerful and you're not, um, and you don't scare me with your Leviathan, Job finally gets a chance to respond appropriately. And in chapter 42, Job answers the Lord. I know you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not hear. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes, or I prefer the translation, repent from dust and ashes. In other words, I will stop feeling sorry for myself. Yeah, you know what? You're God. I'm not God. I'm just going to just going to step aside here. Now, what's fascinating about this ending of the, of the speeches is that Job acknowledges God's power, which he actually never doubted in the first place. In fact, Job has no answer to his questions um, because God's speeches never uh, actually address it, but he is content with, with God's presence. What's funny about this is exactly what Job said would happen, happened. Job was afraid through all his speeches that, you know, I need to bring my case to God, but the minute I try to bring my case to God, I'll be so overwhelmed by his power, majesty, and presence that I'm never going to be able to make my case. That's why he was desperate for that umpire. Well, what happens? God shows up, and Job is so overwhelmed by his power, majesty, and presence that he can't make his case. So exactly what Job said would happen happened. Job backs off, content with God's presence, uh, and repents, I would argue, from dust and ashes, uh, and stops feeling sorry for himself. But that's, interestingly enough, not the end of the story. It is the end of the poetry, but now we get to that prose epilogue uh, that really does add some further twists in the interpreting of this book.